In this next section, we will discuss how we can efficiently diagnose mild to moderate hearing losses. Generally, in the literature, hearing losses are classified in this way. Mild hearing losses are seen as 21 to 40 dBHL, and moderate hearing losses 41 to 70 dBHL. Generally, this will be a pure tone average of 0.5 kHz, 1 kHz, 2 kHz, and 4 kHz. However, of course, configurations of hearing loss like this, which are normal at 0.5 kHz and 1 kHz, wouldn't be described as mild to moderate using the classification we've just described. So often, the literature will also include air conduction thresholds greater than 25 dBHL at two or more frequencies above 2 kHz. Brief inspection of this audiogram may lead some people to describe this hearing loss as insignificant or not important for the normal development of speech. However, if we consider the SII of an, an ISTS signal presented at 65 decibels, the SII will only be 76% for that particular hearing loss, compared to normal hearing, where the SII would be at or approaching 100%. You may now agree with me that that hearing loss that we've looked at will actually pose a significant impact on a child's speech development. In the previous presentation, we looked at this study from the British Medical Journal. In it, we looked at the fact that the prevalence of hearing loss, mild to moderate hearing loss, appears to increase as age increases. In the paper, they state, some children acquire impairment postnatally, Impairments that are acquired as distinct from progressive or of late onset account for 4 to 9% of overall prevalence and 7% in the present study. Thus, they explain only a small proportion of the rise. That is to say, hearing losses that are acquired or progress do not adequately explain the increase in prevalence as age increases. In this paper, they also say, confirmation of impairment is delayed in some children. This paper was published in 2001. This was immediately before the newborn hearing screening program was implemented nationally in the UK. At the time, newborn screening programs varied across the country and diagnostic testing also varied. It can be argued that a hearing loss like this would be missed in a healthcare system that has a he newborn hearing screening program that is not sensitive enough to pick up this hearing loss or diagnostic practices that would miss a hearing loss like this. That is to say, if they were not using frequency specific ABRs or ASSRs to diagnose the hearing loss. If we use a click stimulus for ASSR or ABR testing, all or much of the basilar membrane is stimulated when we present the stimulus. This means a hearing loss like this may actually mask the presence of a hearing loss as the low frequencies would be significantly represented in the trace that's analysed. The high frequency component of the hearing loss would be missed if using a click stimulus. Therefore, there are also frequency-specific stimuli for this kind of testing. Shown here is the narrowband CE chirp, where stimuli at key frequencies are presented in a tight enough band to show frequency-specific information, but allowing enough neural stimulation to be adequately represented on an ABR trace or an ASSR recording. The Eclipse ASSR system uses the narrowband CE chirp as its primary stimulus. I'd now like to introduce you to Constantina Georgia, a clinical scientist at the Royal Berkshire NHS Foundation Trust in the UK. 
she's going to use a recent case of hers to illustrate how she uses narrowband CE chirps and ASSR testing in her clinical practice. So the first case is a baby. They were referred from the newborn hearing screen program. Um, they failed both on automated autoacoustic emissions and automated ABR. Uh, they were born at 42 weeks of gestation. Uh, we saw them a, on two occasions at three weeks and at five weeks. Um, we first tested with ABR for four kilohertz and one kilohertz on both sides. And then on the second occasion, we went on to uh, carry out an ASSR testing. Uh, the results, as you can see, uh, show a asymmetric hearing loss, um, mild on the right and moderate on the left. The ABR results are shown in red and blue, respectively for the right and left, whereas the ASSR results are shown uh, with uh, black dots for the right and um, a next symbol for the left. Um, what that shows is that uh, both ABR and ASSR results um, agree uh, within 10 dB. So on the first appointment, obviously, we picked up what looked like a, a permanent hearing loss. Um, I should add that we carried out bone conduction testing. So testing for um, air conduction for two frequencies and bone conduction takes a long time. Mm -hmm. um, so that was more than enough on the first occasion. And then on the second occasion, when we were actually thinking of uh, fitting hearing aids, we needed more information on more frequencies to set up the hearing aids. Absolutely, and also to confirm, because we would like to have, uh, on permanent hearing losses, we would like to have uh, results from two, on two separate occasions, um, showing a permanent hearing loss just to rule out um, an equipment fault, for example. Yes, yeah, so routinely we carry out ASSR on all our permanent hearing losses. Once uh, a hearing loss has been categorised, um, then uh, we would employ, um, we don't necessarily need to obtain two frequencies um, uh, if uh, hearing loss has been categorised even with one frequency in each ear um, and bone conduction has been um, completed, then we can move to ASSR testing. Um, I don't have any uh, data from uh, um, local audits that we've done, but uh, from my experience, I would say that yes, this points that we, uh, we regularly um, complete the assessments in two uh, appointments. Yes, in actual fact, because um, with um, once we finish the SSR, um, we would want to go through all the results with uh, with the family, and then uh, we either do it on the second appointment, or if there is not enough time, we would book a separate appointment just to give parents uh, the chance to um, for for the news to settle in, for them to formulate their questions, and to go through all the questions uh, and the results with them. Currently, we arrange CMV, locally, we arrange CMV testing um, at the point of the referral rather than at the point of having confirmed a hearing loss. Um, there is a bit of variability across the country, uh, but it's, um, it's 
um, it's well aware that uh, it's very difficult to catch those babies with sensory or hearing loss um, and get the results before there are four weeks. Um, and the four weeks is the cutoff for quite a few departments. Um, the cutoff time for offering treatment. Um, and um, it's an issue where we've struggled and a lot of departments are uh, struggling, especially as um, babies sometimes are referred to us when they're older. Uh, definitely with CMV, yes, and um, we're routinely doing that uh, because we monitor every three to six months. And obviously, as the child grows up, their sleep patterns change and they sleep less. And we don't know how much time we're going to have. Um, ASSR is the first point of test when we're monitoring for um, any signs of progression. And definitely we've, we've had quite a few cases of progression associated with CMV and we were able to identify them on the first appointment and obviously uh, book another appointment if uh, further testing was required. With the CMV cases is that um, what's uh, the advantage of ASSR uh, is that is the binaural testing. So when there is a progression, you don't know which side it's going to affect, to what degree or what frequencies are going to be affected. So basically you have a blank canvas, you don't know what's happening. So being able to test both ears for all frequencies um, is a bonus because you can, you can pick up a, a, a problem f uh, much faster than going one frequency at a time and one year at a time. You're thinking, okay, this is where I need to focus or what's going on here. Uh, whereas with the ABR, it's, uh, because it's serial, um, then it's, it's a matter of chance which side you've, you've started, whether that's the side that's been affected or not.